So the YKEP implemented an economizer package to help improve the overall efficiency of this machine. Now, a lot of people get really debate, well, how is it more efficient? You've got a whole extra compressor in this particular package. At least some of the other machines don't have to add additional motors and compressors and things. Well, let's talk about this and let's start with just going over the basic cycle. And then we're going to dive through the pressure enthalpy chart that makes this refrigerant circuit make a little more sense, hopefully. But let's start off with just the actual mechanical flow of it. So to begin with, we come out the condenser as a subcooled liquid refrigerant. We pass through our first stage metering device. Now this device controls based off of condenser liquid level. So as that level adjusts, we have to open and close this valve accordingly to maintain a liquid level set point. Then we flash off into a medium pressure state. So we are not in a low pressure state, which is what our evaporator is considered to be. Your condenser is your high pressure, your evaporator is your low pressure. So we're at a medium pressure middle point with that. So with that, we're able to get a lot of flash gas to pre-flash. And because of our subcooling, we minimize how much flash gas we end up having to have. So with our economizer, you, you have some subcooling coming in, but you will not subcool by the time you're leaving. But we, again, the subcooling helps mitigate how much flash is required. And that'll make a little more sense when we get over to the pressure enthalpy chart. So to finish the circuit to the evaporator, as the gas is coming into the economizer chamber and flashing, this is a flash tank style uh, of, a, of economizer, our heavy liquid refrigerant falls to the bottom. And by the time it gets to the bottom and collects down here as liquid, we have now fully saturated back to a liquid refrigerant by this point because all of our gas is collecting in the top of the economizer uh, chamber. So this is where we're, we're not trying to create subcooling. We're trying to get the refrigerant partway there in terms of pressure in our uh, uh, PT chart while still maintaining a maximum amount of enthalpy. The more enthalpy we can, or the less enthalpy we have in our refrigerant, the more heat we can take in by the time we get to our evaporator. So this flash gas reduces a lot of our efficiency. So by removing that flash gas from the refrigerant, we can then improve the total effectiveness that that liquid refrigerant that's left over is able to have. Then we have a second metering device, which is controlling liquid level based off of the flash tank or the economizer. This liquid level tells this valve whether to open or close based off of its set point. And then we do our final flash from medium pressure to our low pressure state entering into the evaporator. Now coming back over here, we go up our uh, economizer compressor suction. It's got this whole windy tube comes up, enters our suction. Now this is a separate much smaller centrifugal compressor. Um, the systems I've seen of these, they're using a solid state uh, soft starter to start this particular compressor. The primary compressor is usually gonna be a variable speed, but they've got a few different options there. This compressor, as it's running, it doesn't have to, to get the gas from a low pressure to a high pressure state, which significantly reduces the amount of lift it's required to have and the overall amount of work it has to do in the end. So we're actually, this compressor, while it is a, a separate centrifugal compressor as a whole, there's a motor there having to spin, it's not having to do the same amount of work that it would be, have to be doing, especially for its size, if it was trying to go from fully low pressure to high pressure state. No, we only have to go from a medium pressure back up to a high pressure. And so, and then the process of pulling this gas off accomplishes our saturation that we're trying to achieve with the liquid refrigerant. By saturation, I don't mean saturation temperature necessarily, what I mean is being fully saturated. So with that, let's step over to this uh, pressure enthalpy chart and let's talk about this a little further. So this first point here, this is where we would be leaving our evaporator as a fully saturated gas. So this arc here indicates our uh, point of saturations. So over here, we are subcooled. Over here, we are superheated. In the middle, we are in a state of saturation, meaning we're, we're transitioning between a liquid and a vapor. It's our latent heat side of the uh, refrigerant. So we go from point one to point two, which is our discharge side, and we leave our 
volute coming into our condenser right here at point two. So point two is where we hit that. The first thing we have to do is we have to desuperheat that refrigerant coming into the condenser, and then we can fully condense it down as we drain over the tubes and get to the bottom. And then right about here is when we're getting to the bottom of the condenser where it's beginning to stack as a column of liquid. That's the liquid we're controlling with. Now, point three is the refrigerant that is leaving the condenser and is flowing down into our first stage metering device, uh, entering into our flash tank or economizer. So from point three to point four, that is passing through the economizer. So we went from a subcooled li liquid refrigerant to a saturated medium pressure refrigerant. So over here, we have condenser pressure, medium pressure, evaporator pressure. Now, if we did not have additional subcooling, like what some machines will, will do, we would only hit this saturation point, and then we'd have to come down here, and we'd have a lot more gas that we, we need to take in. Whereas instead, because of our design, we actually reduce even further the work that the economizer compressor has to perform to get the same function by letting our condenser water get us a little bit of subcooling, and then we flash that off. We have less total vapor to have to move at this point. And, you know, our, our secondary economizer compressor can only, it just helps us improve our efficiency that much further. So from here, from point four to point five, we have removed the vapor. By pulling that vapor, our total enthalpy of the refrigerant is reduced and we are returned to a fully saturated state as a liquid refrigerant. Then from point five to point six, that is us flashing through the second stage uh, pressure drop, which is our final metering device, as we enter into the evaporator. And so you can see that you know, we still have some vapor being created. And there's still some flashing happening uh, by passing through that metering device. That's just not a, avoidable having a pressure drop like that. Anyway, from point six back to point one, that is going through our evaporator and boiling off in the tubes and then returning back into our suction side. Now, what we see between point four and point seven, this is the secondary economizer compressor. So down here, this orange line, this is our primary circuit for the primary compressor, but this purple is our secondary circuit. So we're not actually gaining heat when we go, when we flash off and then move over into our, sec our economizer compressor, the secondary. And that's why there's a dotted line here because we're not increasing enthalpy between here and here, but we are drawing in this saturated or this vapor refrigerant. It is a pure vapor by the time it gets to the compressor, even though the heat content didn't technically increase. But then we compress that vapor and it gets superheated as it goes through the compression cycle and sent back into our condenser. And the two compressors uh, marry, but or the the discharge gases blend once they enter into the top of the condenser and hit that uh, distribution rail up there, and we begin to drain back down and, and fall back down in our condenser cycle. So this here is where we're taking that in. Now, one reason we cannot have our economizer tie back into our main compressor is because this is a single stage compressor. So we only have uh, one stage of pressure increase. We're going from low pressure to high pressure. In other machines, we are multi-stage compressors where we are going through multiple impellers. And with each impeller, we are increasing pressure. So the let's say we've got a CVHF, for example, and our economizer line would come in in between the uh, first and second stage impeller, which is your first and last stage. Well, leaving the first stage impeller on a YK or a CVHF, we are pushing that refrigerant from low pressure to medium pressure, and then we go from medium pressure to high pressure through our impellers. So from first stage impeller to second stage impeller. And so because of that, well, our medium pressure inside of the economizer is relatively pretty close. And we can interject that medium pressure refrigerant into that point with by and it helps us still reduce load. And we're not having to send it directly into our suction pressure, which disrupts what the evaporator pressure is going to do. Because if we send it straight into the suction nose cone and get it into that suction pressure and introduce it there, 
well, then we're actually influencing the total pressure that's on the evaporator, which is going to push our saturation temperatures up, which is not what we're trying to do. We can't maintain our set points at that point, everything be efficient. So we don't have, because we don't have the multi-stage compressor and we don't have that mid, in, what's known as an interstage point to send that flash gas back to as a medium pressure, then we have to return it in a different way. So York's solution for this was to take a second centrifugal and implement it on the side to where it can handle that flash gas independently. And both of these can run as just single stage high speed compressors. So if we were to try to send that flash gas over to the main compressor, it, it would be disruptive to the overall flow of the system. And it, it would eliminate or it would hinder our overall performance and our effectiveness of the refrigerant as a whole. It would just, it, it's not conducive. But the studies that I've seen on this show that by using a system like this and using a flash tank and having an interstage of some kind, and you could argue in, in different ways that this is close enough, we, we do end up reducing the total work having to be done by the system because then. The, the primary compressor doesn't have to do more total work, but the refrigerant that passes through there is able to do more work itself. Okay, so the refrigerant, as be, because it becomes more effective as a refrigerant, is able to accomplish more by taking in more total heat than it would have otherwise. And so then the actual total volume of refrigerant that we need to move through the compressor to get the same effect technically reduces a little bit because the refrigerant for for every pound of refrigerant moving through there we're actually carrying more total heat uh more total heat is absorbed per pound than it would have if we didn't go through the economizer so because more total heat per pound is taken in then we don't have to technically move quite as many uh pounds of refrigerant or CFM through the compressor in order to accomplish that. And at the same time, because we're only going from medium pressure to high pressure on the economizer compressor, and we have such a low lift there, it doesn't require near as much uh, energy to move that volume of refrigerant. And we further help that, that economizer compressor because we have subcooling in our condenser, which helps us move even further over on our enthalpy chart so that that compressor has to do even less mechanical work. So by using our condenser water we're, uh, and getting that extra little bit of subcooling, we improve the economizer perf compressor's performance even further. And there's a whole lot of balancing act, ha act having to happen here, but that is the details behind why this compressor works and why it makes sense. You know, it, these are very viable designs. I think this is a really cool thing that York is developing. Uh, it's 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 definitely a bit complicated, and we'll see how it works out long term. They've had issues, but every machine that comes out that's you know trying something new like this, it's going to have issues. So those are to be expected as you work gets those result resolved, like they have, and like others have. You know, heck, when the Daikin WME came out, it had all kinds of problems, especially in the drive package. They got a lot of that resolved. Um, and even train has had several bearing issues and they tried uh, ceramic bearings. Like they've tried these different things and everybody, every time you try something, you're possibly going to fail. Anyway, I would really like you to have to not struggle so much trying to get into chillers and work your way through the chiller side of things. And I'd really like to be able to help you and directly connect with you through a personal community that we can come together as chiller technicians and as people trying to learn and master this craft and only help improve ourselves and share information. And I've got a course that I've built that I really wish I had to help with that process. And it's introduction to chillers at chilleracademy.com. I would really love it if you just go check it out, read through it, see if you have any questions, feel free to email me if you do. And if it's a good fit for you, then come join us over there. Let me help you in your chiller journey and get you where you want to be. MTT, make the time for your family, for your spouse, for your kids. I'll see you later.